Thank you, Roberta. It is a commonplace to state that the Benedictine Abbey of St. Mary Glastonbury was a renowned pilgrimage destination throughout the Middle Ages. The faithful, we are told, flocked to King Arthur's Avalon to view his tomb, Joseph of Arimathea's holy thorn tree, and other wonders. Today, such perceptions are firmly rooted in popular consciousness, and no amount of research and discussion has served to dislodge them. If I might be forgiven for quoting from Wikipedia, if pilgrim visits had fallen after the fire of 1184, the discovery of King Arthur and Queen Guinevere's grave in the cemetery in 1191 provided fresh impetus for visiting Glastonbury. Much modern writing, it seems to me, both popular and scholarly, has given undue emphasis to Arthurian Glastonbury, and in so doing has unwittingly upheld a distorted and largely romantic view of the Abbey's spiritual role, and thus prevented its positioning in the medieval Catholic mainstream. In this paper, I intend briefly to summarize what we know of the character of pre-Reformation devotion at and pilgrimage to Glastonbury Abbey. For much of the Middle Ages, pilgrimage aroused relatively little theological or theoretical concern, and although accepted as meritorious, it was not an obligatory practice. Evidence of pilgrimage is, therefore, not particularly plentiful. Combined with the ferocity of Glastonbury suppression, we are left with little from which to work. The most important sources for pilgrimage, such as the shrines and parochial chapels themselves, shrine books, liturgies, calendars, sacred scrolls, and lists of visitors are all lost to us. And so we must fall back on chronicles, relic lists, episcopal registers, wills, incunabula, the site's archaeology, and the surviving fabric. But despite the variety of potential sources still available, we must be mindful that the information contained in any of them is limited. As Eamon Duffy has observed, the primary purpose of pilgrimage had always been to seek the holy, concretely embodied in a sacred place, a relic, or a specially privileged image. In this regard, Glastonbury qualified on all three counts. Famous for its sub-apostolic founder, St. Joseph of Arimathea, Glastonbury's claim to be the fount and origin of all religion in England seemed no idle boast. Joseph, it was said, had built the old church, the Petusta Ecclesia at Glastonbury, at the prompting of the Archangel Gabriel. Consecrated by Christ himself in honor of his mother Mary, the Abbey's patron and protector, Glastonbury, it was claimed, had been chosen by the Virgin especially for herself. The old church's successor, the Church of St. Mary, which also served as the monastery's lady chapel, was thus widely believed to be the first Christian foundation in the realm. Of undoubted antiquity, Glastonbury was the burial place of saints, the repository of relics, and by the 16th century it possessed two cult images, one of which was regarded as miraculous. It is hardly surprising, then, that by as early as the 12th century, Glastonbury had been dubbed both Mater Sanctorum and Tumulus Sanctorum, the mother and tomb of saints. The cult of saints played a central role in medieval church life. Predicated on the doctrine of the communion of saints, it was believed that the saintly departed could and did aid their earthly brothers and sisters. Graves and shrines, loco sanctorum, were cultic places where the power of Christ could manifest through his elect. Apart from their obvious sanctity as corporeal remains of the blessed, relics were also regarded by the church as precious instruments of catechesis. In other words, educational tools for the instruction in the faith. Visible, tangible reminders of the spiritual realm, relics also granted churches spiritual prestige and patronage, and at a mundane level, a possible, but not guaranteed, source of donations. Our knowledge of Glastonbury's relic collection is based on four lists, two incorporated in chronicles and two discrete inventories, none of which were drawn up later than the second quarter of the 14th century. By this time, the Glastonbury assemblage contained the relics of nearly 300 different saints, and almost 450 individual relics to which a name could be assigned. These relics included the complete bodily remains of a number of saints, at least 10 at a conservative estimate, including Patrick, Benignus, Althswider, and the child martyr Basilius, and substantial portions of others, such as David, Hild, and Aidan. Although Glastonbury's assemblage included major relics, such as St. Philip the Apostle's jaw and St. Helen's arm, the majority of the collection comprised small bones and bone fragments contained in reliquaries and other liturgical objects. Aside from the remains of pre-conquest saints and those relics which survived the Great Fire of 1184, the extant lists demonstrate that the Glastonbury Relic Assemblage was regularly augmented by the community. 
acquisitions such as the large and prestigious collection of Constantinopolitan relics obtained by the sacristan used as common in 1212, and Adam of Sobri's more modest gift of relics of St. Thomas the Martyr and St. Catherine during the second quarter of the 14th century suggest a continual active engagement in fostering devotion through the medium of relic veneration. Information beyond the mid-14th century is lacking, but it seems likely that the community continued actively to acquire relics until the suppression. Although Glastonbury seemingly lacked a specifically designated Custos Reliquarium, custodian of the relics, by 1525 there was a keeper of St. Dunstan's head, and conceivably he had oversight of the Abbey's relic collection. Although a somewhat heterogeneous assemblage, we must remember that relic collections like Glastonbury's were continually in flux. Relics were received from donors and given away by patrons. Cults both rose and fell in popularity, and the relics themselves were vulnerable to theft, neglect, and the vagaries of human memory. The Glastonbury Titus relic list, for example, includes a container of relics incognitis, relics whose identity had been forgotten or which had become separated from their cedula, their identification labels, but were still considered worthy of preservation. The pilgrim's experience, therefore, must be set against a background of gradual but continual change, based on inevitable oscillations of sentiment and a focus of private and collective devotion within Glastonbury's monastic community. In common with some other great churches, Glastonbury also displayed secular relics alongside the remains of the Blessed. Like the Benedictines of Ely, who deposited the bones of seven Saxon worthies in a quasi-shrine positioned on the pilgrim route to the Cathedral Priory's principal cult site, Glastonbury's greatest secular relics, the bones of Arthur and Guinevere, were enclosed in a black marble sarcophagus in the midst of the presbytery. During their translation to this tomb in 1278, the heads and knee joints of both were kept out for the people's devotion. Such treatment of the royal couple's remains demonstrates that they were regarded as worthy of respect, if not veneration, and the parallels with traditional relic exposition could not have been lost in either monks or laity. After this date, there is no further evidence to suggest the active promotion of a specifically Arthurian cult at the Abbey, and despite the claims of much modern literature, the contention that pilgrims were drawn to Glastonbury on Arthur's merits could not be substantiated. The community's treatment of Arthur may have been influenced by that of King Edgar the Peaceable. Buried at Glastonbury in 975, Edgar was revered at the Abbey from the mid-11th century when his remains were disinterred and placed in a casket containing the head of St. Apollinaris and the bones of St. Vincent which the king had gifted the monastery. Thereafter, Edgar's sanctity was promoted in-house and miracles attributed to his intercession, although no formal canonization process was ever pursued. During the second half of the 14th century, numerous other secular relics, the remains of Anglo-Saxon noble donors, were exhibited along with the relics of saints on the presbytery's northern side. Presumably, pilgrims would have seen the respect accorded to these former benefactors as an inducement to make their own offerings. But the display and function of these secular relics in the wider liturgical context, if any, is unknown. But despite its substantial relic assemblage, Glastonbury lacked a major shrine of undisputed popularity. Although Julian Luxford has demonstrated that St. Dunstan was consistently promoted at Glastonbury until the dissolution, a rival and almost certainly authentic body of Dunstan rested in his cathedral church at Canterbury. The affront to Canterbury caused by Glastonbury's claim and the quarrel it engendered is well known, but it did not prevent um, the continual aggrandizement of Dunstan's ferretry at Glastonbury. During Richard Beer's abbacy, Dunstan's shrine was apparently moved to a more conspicuous place, which may indicate a new shrine pedestal and perhaps improved access from the choir aisle for pilgrims. This arrangement of Glastonbury of the Ferrisher Chapel behind the high altar and the tomb chapel of Edgar to the east recalls the arrangement of the shrines of St. Ethelbert and St. Augustine at St. Augustine's Canterbury. Both communities celebrated a sainted archbishop and his king, both were considered founders of their houses, and both saints primarily cultured by their communities and not the laity. But despite their pivotal roles in ecclesiastical English history, neither Dunstan and Edgar nor Augustine and Ethelbert achieved the popular status their communities perhaps envisaged for them. However, there is a fundamental element missing from this largely familiar picture. The most venerable and theologically important cultists at Glastonbury 
that of the Abbey's patron, St. Mary. As I have recently published a full consideration of the Virgin's cultus of the Abbey, I shall not treat it here in any detail, other than touching on a few salient points. As patron of both the Church of St. Mary and the convent as a whole, the Virgin was held in particular honour. The focus of her cult was an ancient wooden statue which miraculously survived the fire of 1184. In the second quarter of the 14th century, during the abbacy of Adam of Sodbury, this image was seen to move miraculously while a whole crowd of secular people looked on and while the monks watched as well. The evident growth of devotion to the Virgin in the wake of this miracle is clearly reflected in Sodbury's actions. Not only did he adorn the high altar of the Abbey Church with a large statue of the Virgin in a tabernacle, but he founded a body of eight secular priests, distinct from the monastic community. Later known as the Clerks of Our Lady, one of the principal functions was to minister daily in the Lady Chapel to the laity. On solemn feast days, the miraculous image was carried with veneration in the sacred processions, along with other relics. And in the first quarter of the 15th century, Abbot John Chinnock clothed the image as befitted it, adorning it with gold and precious stones and enclosing many relics within it. Gifts were presented to the Lady Chapel by successive abbots and the laity, and from the mid-15th century, requests for burial in the Church of Blessed Mary in the Monastery of Glastonbury and in the churchyard of the Blessed Virgin Mary at Glastonbury appear in wills. It was in this Marian context that active devotion to St. Joseph of Arimathea emerged in the early years of the 15th century, but it was not until the construction of the crypt below the Lady Chapel almost a hundred years later that the cultus was actively promulgated on the ground. As the Jesuit, William Good, who was an altar server at the Abbey as a schoolboy recalled in the 1570s, there was likewise at Glastonbury, in a long subterranean chapel, a most famous place of pilgrimage, which was made to a stone image of the saint. But Joseph's importance to Glastonbury should not be overstated. While, as we shall see, pilgrimage to his chapel was encouraged, Joseph was portrayed as both subservient to the Virgin and pointing the way to the mystery she embodied. As I have elsewhere observed, without the antiquity of St. Mary's cult and the mystery surrounding its origins and the identity of its founder, St. Joseph's adoption as the monastery's putative founder would have been impossible. Our Lady's cultus was the devotional focus around which Glastonbury Abbey grew in the centuries following the Great Fire of 1184, and it was the fundamental matrix in which the monastery's legendary foundation could take root. Most important in this regard was Joseph's link to the Virgin's miraculous image. As founder of the Old Church, the first church in England, and the first dedicated to St. Mary, by the early 16th century it was also claimed that Joseph had carved this statue of the Virgin himself and it was the first image of St. Mary to be seen in England. Glastonbury then, through Joseph, asserted its preeminence as the earliest and premier shrine of Our Lady in the British Isles. Turning now to the liturgical topography of Glastonbury's great church, a general reconstruction is possible based on the evidence of chronicles, the standing remains, ex situ fragments, and extrapolation from similar Benedictine churches. This is a complex matter, however, which extends well beyond the limits of this paper. I shall, therefore, only briefly touch on those aspects which directly concern us. The east end of the nave was blocked by a rude screen, and by the end of the Middle Ages, the pulpitum stood under the eastern crossing arch. The presbytery beyond housed the monastic choir, the tombs of kings, and presumably, behind the high altar screen, the Ferretry Chapel of St. Dunstan. Between the tomb of Arthur and the high altar stood the only cultic locus in the great church whose location can be accurately pinpointed, the tomb shrine of St. Athelswyther, which contained her incorrupt body. On the presbytery's northern side stood the altar tomb of Abbot John of Kent. Associated with many of Glastonbury's relics, it appears that it was close to, or possibly formed the base of, a grand ambury in which relics were stored and exhibited. Frustratingly, the disposition of other major shrines is unknown. To the west of the nave stood the Lady Chapel complex. By the 1470s, the positioning of the Lady Altar and Reredos effectively blocked entry to the Great Church by its west door, and so the chapel would have appeared to be a semi-independent entity from the viewpoint of a pilgrim. Divided internally into nave and chancel, the Lady Chapel housed the miraculous image of the Virgin, while the similarly appointed Crypt Chapel below housed the cult image of St. Joseph. In common with other Benedictine monastic churches, the laity at Glastonbury were allowed in the nave during the day, 
pilgrims would have been granted limited access to the shrines of the eastern conventional part of the church only at specific times and in carefully controlled groups. Entry to the Lady Chapel complex was probably overseen by the clerks of Our Lady. The chapel itself was seemingly accessible to the faithful during daylight hours, even during the Lady Mass attended by the monastic community each morning. The only surviving fixture from Glastonbury's great church is the Magna Tabula Glastoniensis, the great panel or record of Glastonbury. Designed specifically for the edification of pilgrims, it was erected circa 1400. Consisting of six vellum sheets mounted on four large wooden leaves, hinged like a book, it survived the dissolution and is preserved today in the Bodleian Library in Oxford. Probably commissioned by Abbot John Chinnock, the tabula's nearly 600 lines of text are almost exclusively devoted to Glastonbury's early history. The tabula's final section lists spiritual benefits in the form of indulgences, which pilgrims could obtain during their visit. The role of indulgences as a motive for pilgrimage in late medieval England hardly needs demonstration. Episcopal registers include countless examples of indulgences which pilgrims could obtain if, penitent, confessed, and shriven, they made their offerings at the stipulated sanctuary. Pilgrims were thus primarily interested in the spiritual benefits of an indulgence and the consequent reduction of time spent in purgatory after death. While other shrines offered reasonably modest tallies, St. William at York Minster, for example, totaled some 444 days, the indulgences at Glastonbury totaled a staggering 64 years, 197 days, a not inconsiderable incentive to devotion to all who visited the Abbey. Explicit evidence of pilgrims at Glastonbury, however, is sparse. Earlier glimpses of the continual round of visitors to the Abbey, which of course included pilgrims, are provided by a short sequence of letters written in 1360-61 by Abbot Walter de Monington, and by the royal visits to Glastonbury from the 13th to the 16th centuries. Edward I and Queen Eleanor attended the translation of King Arthur's remains at Easter 1278. Henry III visited on three occasions, in 1235, 1236, and for three nights to celebrate the Feast of the Assumption in 1250. In December 1331, the 18-year-old Edward III, accompanied by Queen Philippa, visited Glastonbury. Significantly, a papal bull dated November 1332 from Pope John XXII to Ralph, Bishop of Bath and Wells, refers to Edward III's visit to Glastonbury, the reason being given, on account of the multitude of martyrs there buried. Henry VI visited in 1448 and again in 1452 while on judicial tours of the West Country, and Henry VII stayed for a single night in the aftermath of the Warbeck Rebellion in October 1497. Although fleeting visits, some clearly had religious elements, if not motives, and so we should not deny the possibility that these monarchs may have regarded themselves as pilgrims, even if they were formally engaged in other business. At a more popular level, the livelihood of many of the town's inhabitants must have been affected by the flow of pilgrims to the Abbey, which, of course, had extensive holdings in Glastonbury, including the George Inn, built by Abbot John Selwood in the second half of the 15th century. At this popular level, we might expect evidence of pilgrimage in the form of souvenir badges, so often associated with major medieval shrines. Although several pilgrim badges have been tentatively ascribed to Glastonbury by Michael Michener, alternative interpretations have been offered by Brian Spencer, and their association with the monastery is not proven. It is possible, however, that Glastonbury badges have not yet been found. Although this eventuality may seem improbable, the cultus of St. Wollstone at Worcester is a case in point, where the only surviving evidence for the manufacture of pilgrim souvenirs is a single metal ampulla excavated in Dublin. Alternatively, Glastonbury badges may be extant in existing collections, but they have yet to be positively identified. Or, like at St. Augustine's Abbey in Canterbury, it is possible that Glastonbury prohibited the sale of such merchandise. The apparent absence of pilgrim badges from Glastonbury should not, therefore, be given any kind of evidential weight. We finally meet with named Glastonbury pilgrims in the early years of the 16th century, when Joseph's cult was gaining momentum. In 1520, the anonymous Life of St. Joseph of Armatha was printed in London by Richard Pinson. 
perhaps composed by a Glastonbury monk, this simple, mass-produced and affordable pamphlet clearly illustrates Glastonbury's attempts to promulgate its message and promote itself as an important cult centre. After the site saint's life is rehearsed, a passage listing 13 miracles, all of which are noted as having occurred in the 18th year of King Henry VII, 1502-1503, and apparently taken from a longer list, is appended. The miracles constitute a standard set. Two women cured of pestilence, a child raised from the dead, a man's leg freed from an iron manacle, a woman cured of a terrible fistula, and so on. All of the miracles are local, one in Glastonbury itself, and the rest within a 30-mile radius. Most of those who received cures are noted contributing offerings at the shrine, presumably financial, in the form of ready money or lights, while some left ex photos. An attempted suicide from Balmwell, for example, cured of her self-inflicted wound, went to the saint's chapel in Thanks, where the same knife she offered up all bloody there. While Alice, wife of Walter Bennett of Wells, was cured of lameness. Thither was she brought into the chapel, verily she was healed and left her stilts there. These offerings were all immediately intelligible to a medieval audience, mute testimony that here was the power to heal or rescue, and they formed a standard part of a shrine's furniture. Although these miracles were clearly chosen for inclusion in the life as prime examples of Joseph's intercessory prowess, pilgrimages of devotion aimed at gaining spiritual benefit rather than cures were clearly as common, and it seems to be this latter group to which the life primarily speaks. The final decades before the suppression provide further evidence for popular pilgrimage. The account book of William Tromley, cofferer of Edward Stafford, Duke of Buckingham, suggests that the Duke stayed at the Abbey at the end of April 1521, when he offered six shillings and eightpence to the shrine of St. Joseph of Arimathea on the 29th, gave the same sum at High Mass and three shillings and fourpence to the Holy Relics there on the next day, and another three shillings and fourpence to St. Joseph's Shrine on the 1st of May. The provisions for pilgrim, pilgrimage made in contemporary wills echo the popularity of Joseph's cultus. To cite just one example, in 1534, Richard Place, vicar of Kingston, stipulated for a pilgrim on his behalf to offer three shillings and fourpence to St. Joseph of Glastonbury, accompanied by arms of fivepence for the poor. Although we lack the critiques of Glastonbury, such as those produced by the Catholic humanist Erasmus regarding Canterbury and Walsingham, the account of Glastonbury's final episcopal visitation in July 1538 includes several revealing passages. At this date, the community numbered some 52 monks, including the abbot, and the testimony of 34 is recorded. Dom Roger Wilfrid claimed that exhortations made unto pilgrims coming to St. Joseph is not done according to the king's injunctions, a concern shared by John Dom or Richard Walston. In other words, pilgrims to Glastonbury were not being provided with religious instruction. Don William Joseph complained that the brethren doth carry their relics in procession week with small devotion, and that the convent is much grieved with many processions and other ceremonies. Notwithstanding the negative tone of these comments, made by predominantly young monastics, they suggest that pilgrims were still coming to Glastonbury and that the abbey was responding traditionally and conservatively to their needs until the very end. This is emphasized by the Magna Tabula, which still seems to have been visible when the commissioners visited the abbey as the word, as the word Papa or Pope has been scraped out in nine separate places. Despite Glastonbury being the only monastery left functioning in Somerset by the spring of 1539, its account rolls for the year list money spent on mending and gilding the foot of the Lady Chapel's Thurible, on repairs to its window glass, and on brooms for keeping it clean, all of which signal continual heavy usage. Significantly, the sacrist's revenue for the year, some £311, 12 shillings and sixpence, was drawn from a number of sources, including offerings in the old church. The fate of Glastonbury's relics, shrines, and cult images is unknown, but they were probably removed during the first wave of destruction in 1538, a supposition perhaps supported by the pre-suppression blocking of the rude beam socket on the southeast crossing pier, suggesting that the community complied with the royal injunctions against images. Aside from the now missing fragments of black marble-like stone bearing the marks of elaborate workmanship, found by Frederick Bly Bond in the vicinity of the High Altar at the beginning of the 20th century, conceivably fragments of the shrine pedestal of St. Dunstan, 
No fragments of medieval shrine bases have survived on site. But whether this should be interpreted as evidence for the compliance of the community with royal diktat, the post-suppression sale of fittings, or the result of piecemeal site clearance is uncertain. To summarize, the argument of this paper has been a modest and simple one. Notwithstanding the limited and fragmentary evidence remaining, enough survives to allow us to reconstruct late medieval pilgrimage to Glastonbury with a reasonable degree of certainty. In common with other Benedictine monasteries, Glastonbury's community appears to have been broadly conservative in outlook. Actively promoting devotion through the veneration of the saints, the Abbey's relic assemblage, including relics of the apostles, early martyrs, and native saints such as St. Patrick of Ireland, St. David of Wales, and Aidan of Lindisfarne, will have spoken directly to the faithful of the formative days of Christianity and the evangelization of Britain. Positioning itself as the fountain origin of all religion in England, Glastonbury stood alone. The late medieval promotion of the Virgin's active patronage of the Abbey and Joseph's cult as Glastonbury's sub-apostolic founder underlie this assertion. While the monastic community apparently conformed to the Henrican prescriptions of the 1530s, pilgrimage seemingly continued until the suppression in November 1539. Although the Great Church at Glastonbury presented a sequence of devotional foci and housed one of the largest relic assemblages in medieval England, its primary function was clearly monastic. Conversely, the Lady Chapel complex beyond the west end of the nave was set apart both physically and liturgically from the Great Church and its shrines. Promoted as a specifically cultic locus, focusing on the ancient miraculous image of the Virgin, its ongoing structural elaboration and transformation into a double shrine chapel at the beginning of the 16th century with the construction of the crypt below marked the chapel's final transition to a building specifically designed to house the Abbey's principal goal of pilgrimage. Both chapels housed miraculous cult images and both were closely linked theologically, each complementing the other forming a twin cultic site. As such, the Church of St. Mary of Glastonbury, the Abbey's Lady Chapel, constitutes a unique and previously unrecognized survival of English medieval devotional architecture. Thank you.